Married women were not expected to work, and mothers certainly didn't work. Mm. The children would be delinquent, it was proven. Mm. I have great fun now talking to schools, and I say, um, how many of your mothers work? So, how many of your mothers worked? And how many of you are delinquent? <laughs> There's usually one on the back row, but I don't <laughs> see it here. <laughs> My name is Dr. Jadida Eisler. I am an assistant professor of astrophysics at Dartmouth College, as well as the CEO of a small nonprofit called the STEM on Route to Change Foundation, where we use STEM as a path to social justice. I am honored and delighted today to speak with Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell, uh, who is an incredible scientist, a rock star in our field. Um, but she's also, and I'm only going to give you a subset of the things that she's done, she's been the president of the Royal Astronomical Society. Mm -hmm the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and the president of the Institute of Physics. So I heard that you call that a serial president. Yep. <laughs> and in other circles, you might call that a boss. B-A-W-S-E for the monitors. Um, <laughs> anyway, so let's start with the first question, which is where are you from and how did you get interested in astrophysics? I come from the north and west of Britain, mm -hmm. British Isles. Um, my accent isn't just funny here, it's funny in Britain as well. <laughs> so don't panic. <laughs> so yes, um, it's a wilder country, more mountainous country, not the soft, civilized stuff that there is down south. Got it, got it. And from the wild country, I guess, where did you decide you wanted to do astrophysics? Well, I knew I wanted to do astrophysics and particularly radio astronomy, before I'd left school. Mm -hmm. I did a physics degree, first of all, in Scotland, mm -hmm. um, and then was looking for a place to do a PhD. Um, didn't seem to be getting into Manchester, Jodrell Bank. They were rumored not to take women anyway. Mm. So I thought, I'm going to Australia, to Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, but their academic year starts a few months later, so I had a few months in hand, so I thought I'd better put into an application into Cambridge just in case. Just but in case. I don't expect I'll get in there. And that's always how the story goes. So you, you got in there. Yeah. And you did some really important work. Um, you, it sounds like, as a lover of compact objects, it sounds like you were actually, as a graduate student, looking for quasars, which are super massive black, black holes. holes that you research, yes. <laughs> um, for sure. <laughs> um, but you needed a new detector. So you actually ended up building this yeah. radio telescope that you need. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah. It was a huge radio telescope. It covered an area like 57 tennis courts. I didn't build it all myself. Uh, there were about six of us. But my main job was all the connectors, plugs and sockets and transformers and this kind of stuff. Um, I did enough of the heavy duty stuff that I could swing a sledgehammer, as we call them. Mm. I don't know what you call them. Same. Um, that wasn't one of the skills you normally get during a PhD, but yeah. <laughs> but you got it. You yeah. got it. And then you turned on your telescope. And it worked first time. Nice. So those connections all worked out. Yep. Nice. That's unusual for radio telescopes, but it worked first time. Still true. And so the rest of the construction team moved on to other things, and I was left as the grad student to operate it and use it for my thesis work. Nice. Okay. And so you used it for your thesis work. You turned it on. Mm -hmm. You're receiving signals. Mm -hmm. What did you find? Well, we were looking for quasars. Mm -hmm. At that time, quasars were very, very new, quasi-stellar radio sources. There were about 20 of them known. They were a big puzzle. They were apparently very distant. They were also extremely strong. How could they be both? Mm -hmm. And my particular task was to find more. And I did. I got the number up from about 20 to about 200. Thank you for Which makes a good sample. Yep. Yep. But um, I hadn't expected to get into Cambridge uh, when I got there. Core, they're all very bright. Yeah. Quite keen to let you know it. <laughs> but, uh, but terribly clever. And I'm not that clever, and they've made a mistake, you know, admitting me. They're going to discover their mistake, and they're going to send me home. Huh. We have a name for this these days. Is it known to you? Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Yeah, we didn't have a name for it then. It wasn't recognized. 
um, there's a risk that a student feeling that will take themselves off home mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things we have to look out for in Oxford these days. But I'd had a bit of a fight, more than a bit, quite a fight to get to that place. So I wasn't going home. I was waiting to be sent home. Right. And until they sent me home, I was going to work my very hardest so that when they did send me home, I wouldn't have a guilty conscience. I'd know I'd done my best and I just wasn't bright enough. Which we know is not true. So uh, way to yep. prove them wrong on that. And in fact, we're going to come back to that imposter syndrome and the very important work you've done on that. Um, but let's zoom in on the science since mm -hmm. our level of geekery is, you know, should be shared with the broader audience. Um, so talk to us about the actual discovery. What did you see? What was, what was different about it? And why did it cause such a stir? Right. Um, I'm going to be very techy, just in case there are people who want the really techy stuff. Um, I was looking for rapid fluctuations because quasars twinkle. You've maybe been told the way you can distinguish stars and planets is that stars twinkle and planets don't. It's a matter of angular diameter. The stars have smaller angular diameter than the planets and are more vulnerable to irregularities in the atmosphere. There's something analogous with quasars. They were known to be compact, uh, whereas most radio sources were broad. And it had been discovered by another female grad student ahead of me that there are irregularities in the solar wind which cause quasars to twinkle, but not the broad radio galaxies. So I'm looking for twinkling, rapidly varying sources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yep, there were lots of quasars quite a lot of radio interference, lots of things give radio interference, mm -hmm. particularly when you have a telescope that That's big, big yeah. very sensitive. But at a level of about 10 parts in a million in terms of the quantity of data, there was a little rapidly varying signal that wasn't just quite right. Mm. Mm. Um, the first few times I saw it, I think I logged it with a question mark. but. Uh, those of you, maybe other people in the audience, done physics degrees. There were times in my undergraduate degree when there were bits of physics I didn't yet properly understand, but there was an exam next week, mm -hmm. and so I had to learn it parrot fashion. Mm -hmm. And those bits always kind of stuck in my mind. I must take time, go back and sort them out, and I usually did. And at some subconscious level, this funny little signal stuck in the back of my mind. Yeah. It often wasn't there, it didn't appear regularly. But by the third or fourth time it had appeared, my brain said, you've seen something like this before, mm. haven't you? Mm -hmm. You've seen something like this before from this bit of the sky, have you not? And that's a great help, because you know where which previous recordings to go retrieve. I had them filed by which strip of sky, which declination we're looking at, and I had shoe boxes for these rolls of chart paper. I mean, there weren't computers. Everything was hard, you know, hard copy. And so you pull out the shoe box for that strip of sky and you spread out the charts. You need lots of space like this and you line them up. And okay, that one I saw, I logged with the question mark. It wasn't there, it wasn't there, it didn't appear that time. Ah. I don't think I noticed at that time. Hmm, no, no. Yes, I logged that with a question mark, and here's this one. And look, they all line up. Mm. It's keeping the same sidereal time. It's keeping its place amongst the stars. So it, it was rhythmic, it had a period, it was... It was... It was coming back every time, well, not every time, but whenever we looked at that bit of sky, mm -hmm. we might or we might not see it. Mm -hmm. So I want to just back up to give the audience a visual. I think we have something that actually comes from popular culture, which uh, you impacted greatly, uh, that sort of yeah. sows a, a visual of what you're talking about. Um, and so he here it is. Uh, if you all might remember this t-shirt from Joy Division. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Kind of a big deal. Yep. So what they've done is they've taken the first pulse, and then the next one they've written above it, the next one they've written above it, and so on. And so you see a whole stack of the pulses. Now, 
That's done with much better equipment than I had. I didn't see that much detail. But, but you did see these consistent pulses, which was really interesting. Okay, and so you bit of sky, you see these pulses. Uh, it's not what you expected, question marks every time. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that you had sort of a nickname for them before you understood what it really was. Yeah, and unfortunately the nickname is stuck. Um, you can see it on this... Um, it says CP1919, that's Cambridge Pulsar, Right Ascension 1919, LGM1. Any guess what LGM stands for? Green, little green men. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? So you really didn't know, but there, there seemed to be this coherent signal, so you're trying to figure it out. So let's fast forward. What is actually ha happening. Tell us, what is this object in the sky that's doing this? It turns out it's an object about the same mass of the sun. That's a thousand million, 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 million tons. It's all crammed into a ball 10 miles across. The density is large, yes. to put it mildly. It's not large enough it makes a black hole, which is what you're studying, yeah. but it's the last stop before a black hole. Um, it's spinning because it was a big star that has shrunk, so it's spinning very fast. And these ones apparently have quite a strong magnetic field. So you've got a spin axis and a magnetic field at a different angle. And so as the star spins, radio astronomers over in this part of the universe, I'll come back to you later, you see a flash every time the beam sweeps across you. And it's doing it typically once a second, twice a second, ten times a second. People in this part of the universe might be seeing a faster one. I don't want to give anybody epilepsy, but uh, <laughs> so I'll stop. But. So, yeah, we see those that have a beam pointed towards us, we see. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably only see maybe 10% of them, because the others' beams don't sweep across the Earth, but there will be lots of others. So this was a completely unexpected discovery, right? Like, people oh, had yeah. only theorized these neutron stars, these pulsars, right? Well, that's a bit sweeping. There's always people theorizing about something. That's true. Whether you believe them is another issue. Fair point. Yeah, so there were people theorizing about it, but nobody took much notice. Right, right. And mm. so it was like this magical thing uh, that you found. I think we have an image of an actual one, so let's look at a, a particular... This is mm. the crab pulsar. Do you want to tell us a little yeah. about it? Yeah, so there's a famous... Thing Thing in the sky called the Crab Nebula, a star that was observed by ancient Chinese to explode in 1054 AD. And that exploding star has left one of these neutron stars, pulsars, 10 miles across, spinning in the center of the nebula, which is the debris from the explosion. And this particular photograph combines some X-ray data uh, where you see the kind of conical stuff with the tongue hanging out. That's the X-ray emission. And then you can see some nebulosity that's also excited by the pulsar splurged around it. Yeah, right? So you've got this amazing compact object that's like spinning itself around and spewing stuff out. And this is, this is a Hubble plus Chandra image. Hubble, I think Hubble it is. plus Chandra. Right? So this is real yes. data that, yeah. that NASA has collected of a pulsar, which is amazing. So, in, so then in 1967, I think it's when you found this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 1974, the Nobel Prize was awarded mm -hmm. for this discovery. Yep. Um, but it wasn't awarded to you. No. 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 T. Hmm. Okay, so it was awarded to your advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at the I wasn't there, but I think at the time and also subsequently, this caused quite the kerfluffle. Uh, because you found, you discovered the, the object, uh, but you were not recognized um, in its discovery, which Science Magazine called, quote, one of the most significant scientific discoveries in the 20th century. Uh, and I think, you know, every, not everyone else, but a lot of other folks felt like it was one of the most blatant snubs of women scientists at a moment when um, we were just sort of getting on. Yes, and I think also grad students felt it was a snub of grad students. Yeah. So some of my contemporaries changed Nobel to no hyphen bell mm -hmm. prize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and that makes sense. And it's, it's interesting, right? Like I, this point, I've always, always wanted to talk to you about this. So when they asked if I would interview you, I was like, let's do it right now. Um, but 
I've always wondered about this because, and it's, I'm going to frame it in Ta-Nehisi Coates' language of mythology and fact from yesterday. Um, he talked about how you know, facts can only do so much when we've got a mythology built around. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned imposter syndrome, which is incredibly important for the work that we're uh, both really interested in doing. Um, so the mythology is that women just are inherently not as interested in science. Mm -hmm. And so our job, our moral responsibility is to get them interested, attract them there. Yeah. Um, the fact is, is that we we actually have the same interest because the brain is the brain and we have interests just like anyone else. And often what we're facing is a current, a headwind uh, mm -hmm. in the direction of where we're going. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned you had already had imposter syndrome when you yeah. were at Cambridge. Then you have this discovery. It's sort of you're overlooked for your own discovery. How did you feel? And when that came out? And then how did you persist, right? That's a huge blow to the psyche and to mm -hmm. use the, the technical language, mm -hmm. to the physics identity. Well, I'm quite a political animal. Um, I recognized immediately that this was a very, very important award. Up till then, no astronomer of any ilk had received a Nobel Physics Prize. And there is no Nobel Astronomy Prize. So this was a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. um, created an enormous precedent, and I recognized that instantly. I'm quite a political animal. Mm -hmm. um, and reckoned that, you know, other astronomers were going to walk through that door. Yeah. And that's been true. Since then, probably about 20 astronomers mm -hmm. have had the Nobel Physics Prize. So that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a, a little bit tragic, and it came at what was quite a difficult time for me. Um, I got married very soon after the uh, PhD, and by that stage I had a child. And in Britain, I don't know if it's true here, but in Britain, married women were not expected to work, and mothers certainly didn't work. Mm. The children would be delinquent, it was proven. Mm. I have great fun now talking to schools, and I say, um, how many of your mothers work? So, how many of your mothers worked? And how many of you are delinquent? There's usually one on the back row, but I don't see it here. <laughs> no, it's good, right? That, that so, is... enormous pressure on yeah. women in Britain to conform to the, the female feminine image, mm -hmm. um, which I find extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. hard enough being one of the few women in science without having that burden as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can remember a neighbour saying to me, You've got a husband, a new baby, and a new house, and you say you're bored. What's wrong with you? Well, what is a life without pulsars, is what I'm saying. That would <laughs> yes. be my response to that. Um, right, so, so you were able to persist um, and move through the space. And I think it's important for these moments when they happen for us to think about the fact that we're not just talking about the cold, hard facts, right? We're talking about humans, mm -hmm. interacting with humans, humans lauding other humans, overlooking other humans yeah. in the scientific enterprise. And it's not just oh, if we could just get folks interested, because it's not necessarily safe in the, in the same ways for everyone else. However, the story gets thicker. <laughs> um, in 2018, you were awarded the Breakthrough Prize uh, for your contributions to fundamental physics, uh, almost 51 years after your discovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and as of the time you won it, it was the most lucrative academic prize in the world, and more than twice the Nobel Prize. <laughs> by, Prize. by coincidence, just, of course. I mean, just, yes. you know, yep. just FYI. Um, and the Financial Times actually called it the 21st century Nobel, right? Yes. So you won this incredibly important award. Um, and there are two things I want to go with on this. One is you did a really generous thing mm -hmm. with your 3.2 million pounds. Uh, could you tell us a little two, bit? 2.3. 2.3. 2, 3 million pounds. 2.3. Or 3 million dollars. That's where I was going. Origin. See, that's yes. why we work well together. Yeah, we do. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about what you did with that award. Well, I reckon a major factor in the discovery of pulsars was that imposter syndrome. I was so sure I was going to get thrown out that I was being really, really thorough. And I noticed this 10 parts in a million anomaly. So I thought, right, certainly science in Britain is a bit white male. Maybe we need more people who might have imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And certainly diversity would improve the community a lot. Mm -hmm. So I 
phoned up the chief executive of the Institute of Physics and said, um, would you like $3 million to set up a fund to fund postgraduate students in physics who come from backgrounds where there aren't many postgraduate students in physics? And without hesitation, without putting the phone down, he said yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for doing that. It will open the door for many, many folks. Yeah. I'm just going to put this one small plug in, which you didn't even know I was going to do, but um, that, those funds will be tied to the students. Um, but it's the award right now, so you can help celebrate folks of color, um, underrepresented uh, folks of color, uh, women and refugees through this program by mm -hmm. helping support the Bell Burnell Graduate Scholarship Fund, which is administered by the Institute of Physics. And my last question with our last few seconds yes. is what do you think the role of recognition is in actually removing imposter syndrome and making a more equitable space for everyone in science? I think we're learning slowly that diversity is, is a great help. I think up to now, People from underrepresented groups have probably felt a bit lonely, in a yeah. sense, few kindred fi figures. Yeah. So I hope it'll make the physics community in Britain and Ireland uh, stronger and more accessible for people who aren't just white males. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and for your work and your intellect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>